Mr. Rogers, thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate the opportunity. Delighted to be here, Johan. Let's first uh, talk about the United States. The U.S. economy somehow limps along. There's no growth dynamic, at least in my opinion. Yet, we got the Dow Jones Industrial Average going to a new all-time high. Is the flood of central bank liquidity looking for returns creating a new gigantic bubble in front of us? And it's the first time in recorded history where you have all major central banks printing money at the same time. You know, the Japanese said in December, we will print unlimited amounts, that's their word, unlimited amounts of money. So the American central bank said, well, we, can, we can print more too. Then the English said, well, we will print more, and uh, as you know, you, the Europeans are printing more. So this has never happened before. Obviously, there's an artificial something going on, because it's all based on printed money, staggering amounts of printed money. This is going to end very badly. Do you see that we will, in any foreseeable future, go back to a more conservative approach to monetary policy, or will this just go even more money printing and even more money printing? How, how do you envisage that? Sure, and I, I thought in 2012 we would go back to some more conventional uh, monetary policy. But unfortunately, it's it's all getting worse. They're all trying to top each other. The, as soon as the Japanese do something, somebody else does it. Every every time somebody does something, then another one jumps in and says, "We will top you." Everybody's trying to drive their currency down, and this is this is not good. In the 1930s, as you know. Everybody tried to beggar thy neighbor. Now we're all trying to beggar thy currency. This is this is this is absurd. So, are you buying uh, United States stocks and the Dow Jones Industrial in any sector? No, no, I don't have. You know, I don't. I don't. I don't think I have any United States stocks. If I do, it's very few. It's so few I can't even remember. Uh, no, no. Um, I own some currencies. I own commodities because normally when there's a, a lot of money printing, you protect yourself by owning real assets, um, whether it's silver or rice or whatever it happens to be. Because if the world economy gets better, commodities should do better because of shortages. If the world economy doesn't do better, then they'll print more money. I, I own some shares in Japan, I own some shares in Russia, I do own some shares around the world, but mainly I've invested in other things. There is some, some sort of shale gas boom from the production of gas and oil from shale reserves in the United States. Um, there have been, the Chinese have been buying. Um, would you buy as well? Is that a sector which is interesting for the next years for an investor? Well, if I were going to invest, I would invest in the natural gas itself um, because natural gas has come down a lot. The, the natural gas boom, you know, there was a huge amount of drilling, but unfortunately what we're finding now is that the number of drilling rigs has gone down by 75% in the last year and a half because these wells are very short-lived wells and they're not so profitable, it turns out. It's all sounded great at first. Uh, also, the number of pumps to keep these wells going has dropped by 50% in the last year because it's just not the bonanza everybody thought. The U.S. Department of Energy has uh, projected that natural gas production will be up a little bit this year, but that it will be down in 2014. So uh, the press is full of all of this talk about America's going to be energy in independent, et cetera, et cetera. Out there in the ground, out there close to the ground, it's not happening quite the same way that the, that the PR would have it. Yes, and, and apparently for oil, and the oil hasn't been going as long as the natural gas, but the wells also, the oil wells apparently declined production by 38% in the first year. So right now everybody's running around doing all these drilling because it's so wonderful, but the production we're finding drops pretty quickly. So this is no real game changer for the U.S. economy? So with a structural shift down in prices and everything will be good from that standpoint. Um, is that going to be? Well, it's wonderful if it were true uh, and if, it's, if it does last. If, if these wells, if we can solve the problem some, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a problem of nature, maybe we cannot solve the problem. But if the problem could be solved, sure, then there's a, there's a lot of shale gas in Europe, there's a lot of shale, there's a lot of shale gas everywhere, China, you, Russia, Australia. No, it could, it could, it could uh, bring the price of energy down a lot for everybody in the world. And then we would all be much, much better off. Now, this is not going to happen overnight. 
because in Europe they haven't even started yet. In, in, in most of the world they haven't even started yet. So it would take a while for the production to come on stream. But if if our experience in America is accurate, it's not a game changer at all. It's a short term kind of thing, but it's not it's not long lived enough. So when it comes to um, China, they got whole different problems uh, than Japan, for example. Japan has a deflationary problem. They have uh, low growth. In China, they have um, potentially too much growth and high inflation. So they're trying to to fight inflation. Are they going to be successful? Especially in the um, in the housing sector, they said, "Okay, we are in sorrow about that." Well, China has been trying to do something about its housing bubble, uh, which has been going on for the last decade. And every two or three years, they try to tighten up and cool it off, and they do. But they never stay tight long enough, at least in my view. They never kill the housing bubble. Uh, and they're, they've loosened up again. Will they solve the inflation problem? I don't, in my view, not until they uh, make the currency convertible. One way to solve the problem would make the currency convertible, then prices could adjust, money could move in and out of the country, and then you would, right now all the money's trapped in China, so everybody puts it into real assets or into housing, and so it causes prices to go up. If the money could go in and out, then it wouldn't have that problem. Will they solve the problem? Yes, someday they'll make the, the housing, uh, make the currency convertible. By 2012, they'll make the currency convertible and everything will be okay. I don't, you know, I don't know why they haven't done it by now. They should have done it by now, but they have not. Is the Chinese Central Bank uh, buying gold right now? Well, I don't know if the Chinese Central Bank is, uh, but the Chinese are. If you go to China, you will see shops everywhere for gold now, which did not exist 10 years ago. You will see ads on the Chinese TV encouraging people to buy gold, and people are buying gold. Is the central bank buying gold? I don't know. I suspect they are. They say they've increased their gold holdings, but they don't tell me. Maybe they tell, maybe they tell you all, but they don't tell me. <laughs> Um, I read a piece, a news piece, I guess it was from, from the Wall Street Journal, writing that the CFTC is um, about to start an official investigation. That there was the LIBOR interest rate manipulation. They say that after that, it might be possible that even gold and silver prices have been manipulated on the London gold fixing or something around that. Um, my question is, do you think that gold and silver prices are somehow being manipulated? Well, I don't. I have been reading about this conspiracy in silver and gold for at least 25 years now. Um, I'm skeptical because with LIBOR, it was just a few people saying this is the answer. But with gold and silver trading, it's traded on independent exchanges. It's traded in Japan and China and Australia. You know, it's uh, Europe, it's America. It would be, it'd have to be an enormous conspiracy for them to pull that up. Maybe it is, maybe it is, but I'm skeptical myself. So, um, do you do you still, um, when it comes to a price outlook for gold and silver, do you think that, or you would not rule out, you said in the past, you would not rule out gold prices to go much lower, to 1200 I guess, was a price target you named. Um, given that, do you think that this would be a potential end in the bull, in the bull run for gold? Well, no, I don't think the bull market will end in gold. What I said was that normally all assets correct 30 or 40 percent every year or two or three. It's just the way markets work. Gold has only been down uh, 30 percent once in the past 12 years, and even then it ended up for the year. This is extremely unusual for, for any market. So what I said was that if gold were to correct 35 or 40 percent, it would go to 1,200. If now I don't, I, gold needs to correct. It's supposed to correct every two or three years. It hasn't, which worries me. If it did, if it did, I hope I'm smart enough to buy more. Uh, it should, but that doesn't mean it will. It may go to 2,400 before it goes to 1,200. So, have you stopped buying silver and gold right now because you expect the correction to come? I. I uh, periodically buy gold when it goes down, like it's, around, it's under 1,600 now, I bought a little bit more. But no, I'm not a big buyer of gold or silver. Um, but I do buy it at occasion when it goes down a lot, just to keep my foot in the, keep my foot in the door.
So uh, if it goes down a, a lot, if uh, you know, right now the the Indians, the Indian government, for politicians, are blaming India's problems on gold. Um, gold is their second largest import uh, into the country. They are the largest consumer of gold in the world. If the Indian politicians do something, it would be foolish. But politicians do foolish things all the time. Uh, it would drive the price. Of, that would cause gold to go down. If something strange happens in the world, it could cause price of gold to go down. If it happens, I hope I'm smart enough to buy more, because the gold bull market is not over yet, not not for a long time. So for the younger people uh, watching this interview, um, what would you say to, to a 25-year-old today? How should she or he invest in today's environment? There are negative real interest rates. There is volatility all around. There are all these uh, uncertainties. How should she or he react in this environment? Nobody should invest in anything unless they themselves know a lot about it. I mean, if you watch somebody on the Internet telling you what to invest in, you're going to go broke. You know, that's a very bad way to invest. She should invest only in what she herself knows a lot about. If she doesn't know a lot about something, she should just keep her money in the bank until something comes along where she sees great opportunity and invest. Listening to some guy on the television or in the newspaper or the magazine or on the internet, you're going to go bankrupt investing that way. Don't listen to me. Maybe listen to you. Or maybe listen to your, your, your own network, but don't listen to me. I got to show everybody can buy. Listen to gold. <laughs> Boris of gold. Yes, Boris of gold. You can get investment ideas, but don't listen to me. Do you think that um, on the long term we have a huge debt problem? So that, uh, again, on the long term, thinking about the long term, we have got a huge debt problem in the United States, in Europe, in Japan. How is that going to play out? How is that going to be solved? Well, you in the, 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 little, the, the woman we were talking about before, who her investing, she should move to Asia. <laughs> you know, America's the largest. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, my daughters live in Asia. My daughters speak Chinese. The largest debtor nation in the history of the world is the United States. You know, there are huge debtors in the world. You know where they are. You can look out the window and see some of them. Just look east and you'll see them. And look south. There are a lot of big debtors, but they're not in Asia. The largest creditor nations in the world are China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. Japan has huge internal debt, which is a serious problem. But, but they're the second largest international creditor in the world. So. Yeah, the gigantic debt problems that are going to cause us all terrible problems in the West and in Asia. So what she should do is go go west, go west to uh, whichever way you look at it. Yeah, go east, go west, wind up in Asia. Um, my last question is about um, industrial metals. They're somehow correlated to economic activity. Um, they have been going down at a time when stocks went up. What's going on there? That's an extremely good question. Uh, what seems to be happening is that the Chinese have stopped stockpiling or have working off their stockpiles. Uh, but the longer term bull market in commodities is not over. You know, you recently have had Rio Tinto and B8, the big metals companies, cutting back and canceling their uh, capital expenditure programs because they're all very worried. So that just means that the bull market, the supply part of the bull market anyway, is going to go on for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm more optimistic about, uh, about uh, agriculture than I am industrial metals, but I own them all. So Mr. Rogers, thank you very much for these interesting insights. It's, it's my pleasure, Joanne. Anytime.